Hi, I'm Greg File, and today I'm going to talk a bit about compiling the categories. If you're not familiar with the project, it was a paper about five years ago from Conal Elliott. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it's fundamental to all the work in this talk, so it's important to have at least some idea. Um, the paper relied on earlier work that showed that the models of the lambda calculus are exactly the Cartesian closed categories. And also, there's a transformation from simply typed lambda calculus to the vocabulary of CCCs, uh, Cartesian closed categories. This means that any lambda expression uh, has an interpretation in every Cartesian closed category. Conal realized that Haskell's pretty much lambda calculus, right? And so we should be able to translate arbitrary Haskell code to a Cartesian closed category of our choice. Uh, so he implemented this as a GHC plugin that would basically take GHC's core representation, which is the most lambda calculus -y of Haskell's intermediate representations, and rewrite it into the vocabulary of Cartesian closed categories, um, interpreting into whatever category you want. So what does this mean practically? Well, all sorts of things form Cartesian closed categories, uh, other programming languages, uh, computer hardware, uh, reverse mode, automatic differentiation, etc. So instead of working within an EDSL um, or some other external approach to kind of work in the domain, in these different domains uh, when you're working in a Haskell project, you can tell GHC uh, via type class instances how your target category or how your, your, yeah, your target domain forms a Cartesian closed category, then indicate in your code which bits of Haskell you want to interpret in that category. Uh, one neat thing about this is that it doesn't work at a level of programs. Right? It doesn't take like a whole Haskell application and then treat it differently and spit out, you know, a different application that that works in that domain. Uh, it integrates much better than that. It works at the level of, of functions, and so you can basically um, write your functions in Haskell and say that you want individual pieces of that to be interpreted in a different context, and then still use the results of that different interpretation in the larger Haskell context. So here's the overview of what I'm going to talk about now that I've given that introduction. Um, you know, what we're using this for, um, what didn't work for us, what we improved, how to use this plugin, uh, and what's left to do in the plugin. So we are Katie Hawk, which is a company building the next generation of flight. Uh, unlike most of my other talks where I have to disclaim this, uh, here I can say it. Yes, we do use what I'm about to talk about at work uh, in a very fundamental way. So we use it for getting this plane into the air and keeping it up there. So I'll do a brief pitch for the plane. So the vehicle is called H2. It's a single passenger remotely piloted eVTOL, which is an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. It's a ring, it actually flies. Um, the propellers tilt to convert from helicopter-like lift to plane-like forward propulsion. Uh, there's multiple test flights, multiple days a week, in both remote pilot and autonomous modes. It can land in an area way smaller than a helicopter. Uh, it's much lighter and quieter than a helicopter, and can travel at 156 knots. Really, it's, it's pretty neat. So we have a bunch of these vehicles, and more are being built regularly. Uh, it's still in development, so for the most part, each one is a little bit different from the last. Also, the flight control system for this vehicle is written almost entirely in Haskell. Actually, that's pretty cool in itself, so I guess I can just stop the talk here. TLDR, we have a plane flying on Haskell. That's not really a common thing in the aero industry. But it was already in place before I even started at Kitty Hawk, thanks to Greg Horn and his team of adventurous controls engineers who really you know, took on this, uh, this project to, to do something very different um, from every other project in the industry. So what did we do to like, take this already cool project and, and make it even cooler? Well, when I was hired, um, Here's where things stood. We had about 30,000 lines of Haskell code in hundreds of modules to define the flight controller. It was actually quite cool. Um, we used a higher kind of data approach to allow either direct interpretation of the Haskell or interpret the Haskell into an AST that would be used to generate the C code that's compiled to then run on the aircraft. And I've already used the word interpretation twice on this slide, so you might see where this is going. Um, the higher kind of data approach, though, had a few complications. One, it required redefining the most basic stuff um, so that we could define instances over various higher kind of data functors. For example, we had to redefine if then else, all the Boolean operations, ordinal operations, like and everything from there on up, right? So it, it required extra type parameters, uh, which had very rich sets of constraints uh, that basically had to be passed around through practically every function in the whole system. Since any code that could become part of the controller needed to be aware of higher kind of data, 
uh, it meant that we couldn't use third-party libraries for anything core to the system. So we brought in Konal's Concat, that's the name of his plugin, uh, to move a lot of that complexity into the compiler and allow the controls engineers to write the same kind of Haskell everybody else does. That meant we had to define our own Cartesian closed category, um, one for our CAST. For this, we took advantage of large parts of what already existed from the higher kind of data system. It's not the meat of this talk, but it's been open sourced and we hope it's a generally useful application of the compiling the categories approach. As I already mentioned, you can interpret the same code in multiple ways. In this case, we can both use the Haskell code directly, creating a program that, well, is a flight controller in Haskell. Um, this is useful during development for things like GHCI, where we could debug the library, of course. Um, we could alternatively run the, the code through the plugin and get out um, the result in our target category, again, the AST for, uh, for C. And so when we run um, the Haskell program that, that's produced by that, when we run that Haskell program, it outputs um, a bunch of C code that we can then compile uh, to the plane's architecture and get onto the plane. So we generate a subset of C, uh, which is with guaranteed inbound array access, there's no NANDs, uh, has a deterministic runtime, and we have a randomized expression generation system that ensures that, that the original Haskell and the generated C paths both produce bit for bit identical results, which is what allows our controls engineers to confidently use GHCI during development and not have to always you know, go through the C path in order to, to test that, that their changes are doing what they think they are or that you know, things are behaving the right way. They can trust that the, the Haskell is actually doing the same thing as the C would. So you know, we really hope that this uh, um, category that we've defined here is useful. Um, I caution against looking at it as an example of the approach at the moment. It still has a lot of baggage left over from um, the higher kind of data stuff that we pulled into it. And of course it contains some, um, some stuff that drifted as we settled into the compiling the categories approach ourselves. And so we're gonna keep working on it of course, and hopefully some of that baggage will go away and it will become a better example. But even if it's not a great example, it is a hopefully a very useful um, category um, you know, that you may use in your own projects if you need to produce C code. But Konal's work, uh, his concat plugin didn't actually quite get us there. He provided a huge foundation, um, but his plugin kind of required your code to be written with the plugin in mind. What I mean is basically the plugin can handle lots of stuff, but if you just wrote normal Haskell code, you were bound to bump into edges um, that weren't supported. And so you would have to translate that to you know things that were supported and, and write things in a special way um, that didn't mean anything different, but um, but you know we just couldn't handle all Haskell code. One thing was the case is that inlining had to be handled very carefully, uh, so it made it really difficult to use mod uh, functions to find other modules and especially like third-party libraries that that exist. And so um, you know we had thirty thousand lines of existing Haskell code that flew on our plane um, and we weren't in a position to, to rewrite all of it to meet the limitations or restrictions of Konal's concat plugin. Uh, for example, it didn't support some types. Um, there was no support for recursion in it. Uh, it was quite slow due to some design choices and, and definitely a number of other things. And again, like when Konal wrote all this, uh, it's very much a proof of concept. He's showing that like this is even possible to do and you know that alone was so important um, for our work. So we really built on top of uh, all of his effort um, that got to that point. So we wanted to be able to uh, compile anything to categories. Rather than rewrite the code that Kitty Hawk already trusted, we wanted to extend compiling the categories to work for all of the Haskell code we already used and to get it polished enough that others could easily do the same and use it for their own purposes. Um, really, since I've started working on this project, I've had people coming up to me and ask when they'll, you know, actually be able to use compiling the categories because they've tried uh, kernels and ran into some issue or other that that made it too difficult um, for them to work with. And thankfully, um, through Kitty Hawk, we've had the, uh, you know, the opportunity to to really dedicate the time to to overcome a lot of those things. And we want to make sure that that's, you know, made available to everybody, basically. So, uh, as I mentioned, I'm Greg File. Uh, I'm a programmer at Kitty Hawk. I work on the tools team. 
which basically supports other teams there uh, through software, uh, including the flight controls team um, with this uh, work that I'm talking about today, and also supports uh, flight test uh, with our ground control system and other systems like that. It's, it's a really broad team. Uh, it includes things like GTK apps and um, you know like log querying systems, flight simulation. But this talk is really about uh, GHC related work um, for this um, you know, uh, plugin approach. Uh, so I'm giving this talk uh, from Maui, where I live. I try to spend as much time underwater as I can. And I, I mean that literally. Uh, the longest I spent underwater so far is just like over four minutes on one breath. I can also dive to like 40 more meters deep without any oxygen, just holding my breath. Um, so, you know, if you, if you uh, want to get a question about programming or something answered quickly by me, the way to catch my eye is to like, you know, also ask me something about free diving um, and... Uh, and my interest in that sport or whatever, and it'll definitely uh, make <laughs> make me notice your, your message uh, if it's something you want to talk about as well. So yeah, let me know. Anyway, um, I am just one member of this team of people um, that have all worked on, on this project at various points. Uh, all of them have been invaluable in making it happen. I, like I can't imagine any of these people not having been involved. Um, and of course, way more than, than these people. Um, these are the people who've worked on the code, but um, the the other teams at Kitty Hawk, especially ones like the flight test and controls team, uh, their support has been super important. You know, if they weren't behind this project and believe that we could deliver something um, with it, we really would not have had the opportunity to to spend uh, to make this happen. So I just want to you know spread that recognition around. Um, so just about a month ago. We finally managed to get this open sourced. Uh, I started working on it about two and a half years ago. Uh, it's no longer what I spend most of my time on, but definitely for like a year and a half, it, it probably was. Um, but now it's finally open sourced. Uh, Kitty Hawk has always been on board with, with getting it to be open sourced, um, but it took a while for us to extricate it from our internal code base, uh, especially while it was in heavy development. It was, became much easier once you know it was um, a bit more stable and not, not constantly being uh, worked on. Uh, and we had some, you know, legal um, things to get signed and done before we could actually make it public. But now it's out there. It's on GitHub. You know, you can check it out. You can look at it. Uh, it is not yet uh, published to um, Hackage. Uh, I expect that to happen in the next few days, at least for parts of it. Uh, parts of it have other reasons for not yet being on Hackage, like dependencies. Um, but we'll work on getting everything there. We want this to be as easy to use as possible. Uh, so let's talk about like what is in this project. Um, so we started off um, forking uh, Conal's original concat plugin. Uh, but as we started to work on it, we realized that some of the things that we wanted to do um, for various aspects of our pro of our um, you know flight control system were going to be much more involved. So we ended up rewriting um, the whole plugin, which is very educational. Um, but uh, but ideally, we, you know, in the coming uh, months, we'll work with Konal and others to, to kind of reunify the plugins to some extent. There's already some pieces that we share uh, between the two. And there are some parts that were forked instead of rewritten. Um, and hopefully we can uh, reconcile those, the changes that have happened on both sides of those um, relatively easily and get back to a single place there. And, you know, then continue to, to work through and, and try to see how we can unify these so there's not kind of a, a schism in the um, compiling categories world. <laughs> so some of the things that we added support for, um, like I mentioned before, there was missing some types in recursion. We've added support for those things uh, in our plugin. Um, having code spread across multiple modules and third-party dependencies. So we use Lens and Barbies and transformers and other things like that, um, that, you know, again, we needed to use from the the pre-existing code, and so we made sure that we could support that kind of modularity in there. Um, we support alternate type class hierarchies. Konal's plugin is tied very much to his concat classes type class hierarchy, um, whereas we do support that one. In fact, that is the type class hierarchy that we do use ourselves. But uh, we also support um, base, you know, with its arrow type class and um, commits uh, categories uh, type class hierarchy. Um, and so we made that kind of pluggable. Uh, we support FFI integration. Uh, this is important for us. Uh, as I mentioned before, 
uh, the flight control system is almost entirely written in Haskell. Uh, parts of it are written in C, and we generated C code, so you know it, it worked together like that. So we needed a way to be able to to take uh, Haskell side FFI stuff and basically pass it through to the target category. Um, for our target category, it works very well because again, it's C. But um, other categories could uh, interpret the FFI code in different ways or somehow you know use the C code. Um, but it depends on the category you're going to. Uh, we added references, uh, basically abstractions in the target category, where uh, again, for our target category, which is C, um, C has functions. And so rather than taking our whole Haskell program and turning it into like one categorical expression that does everything, we could keep the modularity to some extent and Haskell functions map directly to C functions. So you get, you know, C functions defined, you get much more readable code with many smaller functions instead of just uh, one massive expression. Um, we improve performance orders of magnitude, um, definitely lots of different places uh, to, to make things happen. But one of the big things is just, again, we're working with 30,000 lines of code, uh, whereas Conal's examples are um, generally much, much smaller than that. And so any kind of performance issue became very apparent um, as you know the code size scaled up. And we definitely run into times when we thought things were non-terminating, um, but then after various improvements, we could you know, get it to work uh, in a reasonable amount of time. But, uh, and finally, we, we added uh, rich error reporting. Uh, if you've ever used the original plugin, anything that goes wrong basically just reports as oops. Uh, and so uh, we kind of took a page from you know, the Rust and doll worlds to try to come up with very descriptive error messages that also provide suggestions as to how to fix the issue you're running into. Um, and so, of course, we're still a far cry from um, from those particular projects that do such a good job at this. But um, it's definitely a direction that we're heading in. And you know, any patches that come in that improve an error message or fix typos in them or you know suggest a new way around something are very welcome. Like, we very much support that kind of contribution. Um, so now, how do we actually use this plugin? I've been talking about this plugin, but you haven't seen anything to do with it yet. So this is basically the simplest possible example. Here we define a new category um, called Hask. Again, this is the simplest example. So Hask is simply a new type around Haskell functions, right? So it does very little, it's, it's practically nothing. Um, and so then we have our category, we have to define the instances that define how it's a category, right? So we have our category instance that says how identity and composition work, uh, which again, they just unwrap that thing through the regular function composition and then rewrap it in Hask. Uh, and then there's an arrow instance. As I mentioned before, we can use base, we can use arrow, but arrow, the arrow operation is super powerful. Uh, it's very rare that a category can actually implement that. Um, if you can, this is great. This is all you need is a category instance and an arrow instance, basically. You can also add arrow loop if you have to deal with recursion, or you can add um, arrow choice or other things like that if you need to. But basically, these two will get you pretty far. Um, however, again, it's very unlikely you can actually implement arrow. If you can, this is all you need. So that defines our category for us, everything we need there. Now what we do is we take the standard negate function and we call categorify expression on it, which takes that expression and categorifies it from being in, you know, a function from A to B to being a Hask morphism, for, or sorry, a function from A to A in this case, into a Hask morphism from A to A, right? And we call it, give that a new function name, wrap negate. Um, that's our categorized, categorified version of, um, of negate. And again, since this is such a simple case, a sense of simple category, we have wrap negate. All we have to do to get the function back, it's called run hask. We can then apply it to the um, value five and print the result. And so running this program, we'll just print negative five. Um, everything is on here except for the imports um, that, you know, that wouldn't fit on the slide. So this, this is using the plugin. But even with this, um, there were cases so at, at Heavysoft, or <laughs> at Kitty Hawk, we, um, Heavysoft is the name of our software repo there. So at Kitty Hawk, we um, have separate teams, uh, right? The controls team is the one that actually writes all of the flight control code in Haskell. And the tools team manages this sort of, um, you know, code generation 
plugin use part of things. So one thing that happens with this is that um, the type of wrap negate, for example, is pretty fragile. You know, in the flight control system, they'll make changes, they'll add type parameter or they'll add parameters or they'll change the types of parameters or things like that. And every time they would do that, it would cause this to break and they would have to find this code, edit it, you know, and kind of break out of their normal development cycle in order to make small patches to um, what really they shouldn't have to pay any attention to at all. So one of the first things we did uh, with this was to to provide a, a basically a bit of template Haskell to simplify that. So instead of defining that function explicitly with a type and all, we have categorify function, which takes a function name and the category you want to apply it to. Uh, that final empty list is actually a list of any um, specializations you want to apply if there's type parameters that you want to specialize before categorifying it. But this will basically give that same function definition. But of course, if the type of negate were to change, unlikely, but in our project, there are definitely plenty of functions whose types change frequently. Um, this would generate a function that matched that new type and would not require any changes in this area of the code, right? So, um, so yeah, that is what I recommend to use categorify function um, rather than uh, using expressions and having to kind of deal with that fragility. Um, so yeah, uh, and here is the compile stanza to compile that particular example. Uh, there's not too much to it, right? Like the, the one thing you have to do is provide the plugin, uh, F plugin option and give it categorifier, which is the module name uh, in which the plugin's defined. And you need to also add categorifier plugin to your dependencies because that is where that categorifier module lives. And so you provide the module for the, the plugin um, and it will work. So let's look at another simple, again, very simple example. Uh, two things different here. Uh, one is that we're using a different category. It's the syntactic category. It's provided as actually as part of uh, Conal Elliott's concat examples library. It's a great library that has a bunch of um, predefined categories in it. This is one of them. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing that's different here is that instead of using the gate in base, something that we know exists or whatever, we're pulling in you know, a function from lens. Uh, so this is, again, one of the third party libraries we had to be able to support uh, and definitely one of the early sticking points with our, with our work on the new plugin. So this basically categorifies the view function from lens uh, into the syntactic category, uh, which basically outputs a textual representation of the categorical expression. So in this case, we categorify lens. Uh, we basically call render on it, which again turns the the, uh, the Cartesian closed category of syntactic into a string for us, and then we, we print that string, and we get um, the comment underneath here is uh, is the output there, formatted a little bit more nicely. But this is basically what it looks like, and that is you know the interpretation of a view in this category. It is you know the categorical syntax for it. Um, and this is a little different because as I mentioned that syntactic comes from Conal's type class hierarchy, uh, not ours, uh, not, sorry, not base. And so, um, so the problem with that uh, is that we need to tell the plugin that we're not using base for our type classes here, right? So it changes, it adds one line here to our um, cabal uh, stanza, which is we have to provide the plugin with an option. So there's a GAC option called F plugin op uh, that gives an option to a plugin. And it starts with the name of the plugin followed by a colon, and the rest of that string is passed then onto the plugin. So here uh, it's hierarchy, it's the next component. So that tells the plugin that this is going to be a value setting the hierarchy to use. And then we provide the fully qualified uh, Haskell identifier for that hierarchy. Uh, as the argument. And again, we have to add um, the uh, the dependency here, categorifier concat integration. That is the integration that lets us use concat uh, with our plugin. Uh, and that provides that that type class hierarchy that says that, you know, this is how we use concat classes with, um, with categorifier. And we, of course, also add the dependency on concat examples uh, in order to get syntactic uh, in scope.
so of course this is already defined for us um, but to get another view as to like what it's like to define a category like we saw the very simple case with hask where we had um just category and arrow here's more what it looks like in the uh in Conal's concat classes library where um, there's a lot more classes they're more fine-grained um, in this particular category the syntactic one there's there's not uh, much complexity right each one is basically printing out the name of its operation um, but it gives a sense of, um, first of all, there's a bunch more categories, more than what's on the screen here. Um, again, more fine grained. And you don't always need to define all of them. Um, depending on which functionality you need, you can um, define ones that are supported by your category or that you know are you need for some reason um, in this from the source, the Haskell source code. Um, but this is to kind of give you some example of what that is. And again, if you use um, commits, categories, hierarchy instead, or some other type class hierarchy, your instances will look different, but it's it's probably quite similar, really. So we've talked about, you know, how this is um, how to basically convert morphisms from a source category or from Haskell to a target category. But beyond morphisms, we also need to be able to convert types, right? And so, um, how do we do that? Well, the plugin doesn't know about every type you could possibly create. What we have the plugin do is understand a small set of what are called standard types um, that we can basically map any type into. So standard types consist of things like either, like tuple, unit, void, um, dict to handle um, constraints, things like that, not too much more than that. And so we have to define an instance of this uh, has rep class uh, for each type that says what the standard representation is. Uh, in this case, for our type, my type, the standard representation is this nested either, right? Because there's three alternatives. And so there's three alternatives in the nested either. The first one is just an A. The second one is a pair of A and B. And the final one has no parameters, so um, it's just a unit. And then we have to have um, functions that convert to and from that standard representation and the, uh, and the actual my type. Two things you might notice about this. First of all, using either and tuples and unit, it looks a lot like generics. Um, just there's no metadata there. Uh, unfortunately, we can't use generics currently. Uh, it doesn't inline enough. We need this to inline very, um, very strongly, basically. And it, GHC 9.2 has aggressively inline generics option, which still uh, does not do a good enough job for us. And also, uh, generics doesn't support enough types, actually. Um, things like constraints, uh, as far as I know, uh, aren't supported. And so um, we would love to down the road take advantage of generics and not have to use this. But um, but for the time being, that's, that's unfortunately not an option. Uh, but like generics, this is very boilerplate-y, right? Like we shouldn't have to write these instances that all do basically the same kind of thing. And thankfully, except in very few cases um, with JDTs, uh, we don't have to. So we can use a bit of template Haskell and all you should have to define is uh, derive has rep for your type, and you will get a you know, reasonable standard type um, to use. And so this is all the boilerplate you need in your code when you define new types that you have to have these corresponding has reps. And the plugin will also tell you very explicitly um, when it needs a has rep that you haven't provided uh, what type it's for and everything. So you know it's pretty minimal boilerplate, but it's still you know would be great to have that derive generic in there instead. So we didn't get everything to work. I mean, we just saw, you know, we have that bit of boilerplate and um, and we needed to get everything to work, right? So we, we can't get an oops uh, or any even good error when we're producing the flight controller. We need to get everything through the plugin uh, one way or another. And um, so really we're compiling almost anything to categories. But what do we do when we can't categorify something? Um, well, we added two loopholes to the plugin. Basically, ways to get things through the plugin when the plugin would otherwise give up. The first of these is called native cat. Uh, it's a type class that basically allows you to specify an explicit interpretation for a particular function in a particular target category. Right. So we used to use this a lot actually in our code. Now we only have one use case left, which is exactly the one you see here. Um, what this instance is saying is that 
for the function k round double in that package. It's a fully qual that you know symbol is a fully qualified um, Haskell identifier. So for that function, when you're categorizing or categorifying to cat, which is our C category, um, instead of actually running through the plugin and trying to process that whole function, you should just um, use the result of calling cat on k round double. Uh, the way the reason this works is because k round double is still defined using our higher kind of data style. So basically, again, like using those type parameters, we can interpret it either as ha you know standard Haskell or um, into our C AST. And so basically, this is just saying like, okay, you called it here with the standard Haskell standard Haskell interpretation, um, but we're going to return to you the interpretation in that um, in that C AST using the old higher kind of data approach. Um, and so this is great. If you have some reason why you have like one function that's getting in the way of you know your project working, you can skip the plugin for it. Very explicitly write out you know what that should look like in your target category. Um, you know, fingers crossed you actually like get it right and it does the right thing. Um, but it allows you to to bypass the plugin when you really need to when something's in your way. Um, and again, this is something we used to use a lot. We eliminated multi more and more and more of these calls over time. And it allowed us to have a working system through that whole transition uh, rather than just dealing with, you know, like, oh, nothing works yet until we can get everything through the plugin. So that's great when you have individual problems like that. But um, sometimes you have whole classes of things. Uh, for that, we have another loophole called automatic interpretation. This is great when you have like a common pattern that gets in the way um, in your code base. Uh, the downside of it is that it does require more knowledge of GHC. You can see in here that it, it works with core expressions and you are actually translating, you know, kind of a kind of function into uh, a kind of expression uh, in the target category. And so, um, so yeah, it, it is more complicated to work with, but it can, it can solve, you know, large classes of, of problems or problems you run into all over your code base um, in one, in one place. So that, that can be very helpful. We do use this also. Um, here are some other, but of course, like we think these workarounds are, are great. They've been very useful and helpful for us. Of course, what we really like to do is patch the remaining pieces so that we don't have to use these things. Uh, one of those remaining pieces is existential types. We don't currently support them because, um, type synonyms can't have existentials in them. So we can't define that has rep type instance, the standard type using for all. One thing we could potentially do is use something like an exist type that hides the existential. Um, but that has kind of cascading effect on the types that are then used within exists. So they have the right shape, um, you know, forcing us to then support additional types as a standard types, making that part of the plugin uh, more complicated. Um, but again, that's one of our, our open problems. Another is support for mutual recursion. A uh, simple recursion works fine. You know, you can, you can use recursion function, recursive functions. We have a lot of that. Uh, one of the problems with mutual recursion is not only does it fail, uh, but sometimes it fails with non-termination, which is of course very hard to identify. Um, the difference is like if it's a local definition like this let bounded um, one, we can the the plugin will identify it and will tell you like where exactly the cycle exists. Um, but uh, but if it's at top level definitions, we can't identify that cycle. Um, and you know it's very easy for mutual recursion on the leak in. Like this is a simple case of of building a record that you know just works in Haskell. Um, but it has that reference to A inside building the thing where you're referring to another field. And so it causes that loop where you need the value of Baz in order to get the bar out of the A uh, when we run it through the plugin. Um, so this kind of case is easy to, to work around by pulling out that value and using it in both places. But really, you shouldn't have to rewrite your code in order to use the plugin. So this is a place where you still do have to do that. And of course, there are places where mutual recursion is more um, fundamental and you can't just easily eliminate it. Um, so you have to, again, have other workarounds. And of course, there, there are other shortcomings than just these two. For example, like you can't use IO anywhere in there. Um, and there are others that we know about, but still more that like, you know, we've covered our own use case for sure, like as other people have different use cases, um, we'll need to find and fix additional things. So we haven't really, you know, gotten to uh, compiling anything in categories yet. We've made a lot of progress on the shoulders of Colonel Elliott um, and others, and, and we're looking forward to, you know, um, fixing a few more of those significant issues. And, um, and again, this does currently work to convert our 30,000 lines of Haskell code that, you know, fly a plane 
into C code that flies a plane. Um, and, uh, and it's been working well for, for a long time now, um, on, you know, in this project. Um, so it really does work. Um, and so again, it's on open source now, hopefully, um, you have some idea of something that might work as a category for you that you could try to use or, or you know, uses of Konal's categories. Um, but let me know, you know, like what you want to use this for. Uh, if you need any help getting anything to work, I'm happy to, to help with any of that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope it was an informative talk. Uh, on the screen now are some of the important links from the talk and contact information for me. Uh, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions about this project now or whenever you have them. Um, and again, thanks so much.